Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Maggie Riley, and I am the Immigration Law and Policy Analyst for Boundless Immigration, and coming in today to talk a bit about everybody's favorite topic in immigration, which is backlogs. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes here to let people join in, um, starting uh, as close as we can to one here. Hi, welcome. Welcome in, y'all. So for those of you who are joining, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit at the beginning here, so I apologize for that. My name is Maggie Riley. I am the Immigration Law and Policy Analyst at Boundless Immigration. Um, so I am an immigration attorney by training, and I work with Boundless to help uh, guide the company so that they can guide our customers through the immigration journey. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is backlogs, which is a perennially hot topic, unfortunately, given that they just keep growing. So. We've had a few more um, people join in. I'm just gonna give it one more second here to let a couple more people who expressed interest pop in and then we'll get started. All right, and I've pulled up a couple notes today. We've got some articles as well that we'll be able to share with you after this live. So if you feel like you've missed anything, if you joined late, no problem. We're also gonna post this video um, after the fact so you'll be able to go back and watch it, gather any other information you might have missed. Hi, welcome. Um, and we'll have all this, uh, we'll share links as well for you guys so you can go back and read about some of the things I'm gonna talk about today. Um, as I've mentioned, we're gonna talk about backlogs today, and this is a pretty big topic um, for a couple of reasons. It's big because it's on everybody's minds. Um, unfortunately, if you are trying to go through the United States immigration system right now, you are gonna experience a backlog somewhere. Um, there are a couple different reasons for that that we'll discuss. Um, but you know, they're just all over the place. The other issue we're seeing with backlogs, of course, is that they are growing. Now this isn't true across the board. There are some um, various types of forms and benefits from USCIS that are coming down in terms of their processing times. So for example, um, DACA EADs are processing more quickly than some other EADs. So those are work authorizations for um, folks who have deferred action for childhood arrivals. Um, so we are gonna see there's some um, variation there across um, which forms are taking longer, which visas are taking longer, but we'll get into some of the brass tacks about what those delays are and why they're happening. So we've had a couple more people join. Welcome. I, yeah, I have missed you guys too. It's good to be back doing these lives. So we're going to get on a more regular topic of these. They're going to be every two weeks on Thursdays. We'll be shooting for 1 p.m. But we'll always um, update our Instagram uh, beforehand so you know when to, expect, uh, when to expect to hear from us. So welcome everybody and here we go. So I'm once again Maggie Riley, the Immigration Law and Policy Analyst for Boundless Immigration. I'm an immigration lawyer by training. I've been practicing for several years before I came to work with Boundless. So my job now is essentially sharing information about the US immigration system, as well as answering questions and talking about how the system all works and what you can expect when you're going through the system. As a caveat to that, even though I'm a lawyer, I am not anybody here's lawyer. I only work for Boundless. And what that means is that any information that I'm giving you all today is strictly general information for informational purposes. I know that sounds repetitive. What that means is I'm not giving any advice today. I'm just trying to describe how the system functions and what you might be um, looking at when you're sort of going through the process. So backlogs, everybody's favorite topic, am I right? So we're looking at a lot of backlogs in the USCIS system, in the Department of State, um, essentially across the board in the immigration system. Even Freedom of Request, uh, Freedom of Information Act requests are extremely backlogged when it uh, comes to the Department of Homeland Security, when it comes to Custom Border Patrol uh, protection, and so on. So really, this is a far-reaching problem that has continued to gain steam even in the Biden administration. Um, a lot of us, you know, had hopes that we were going to see a really marked turnaround in backlogs and wait times um, for immigration processing and documents once we got into 2021. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic had other plans for us. And so a lot of the U.S. embassies overseas, as well as the consulates, which process the majority of um, green card and visa applications from outside the country, are not fully operational yet. Um, some of them are essentially still closed and are not even doing visa interviews. So I saw a question earlier in the chat if we're still seeing tourist visa delays. And unfortunately, the answer there is going to be yes. But it is going to depend on where you're located. 
Some countries, their um, consulates are fully operational. They have opened up more um, widely following the pandemic, which means that it's easier to get those visas. The wait times are not taking as long, um, and you're able to get into the United States in a more reasonable time frame. Um, unfortunately, though, in other countries where the diplomatic service, um, the consular officers uh, who were working there were hit very hard, people were recalled back to the United States, and the consulates essentially were shuttered, um, some of them are still um, still under those situations. And so you're looking at, in some cases, a wait time of over a year for an interview. Some consulates, I've heard rumors of almost two years. So that's really going to depend on the type of immigration process you're going through. Um, green card applications, of course, are going to be that two-step process where you file the I-130 with USCIS first. Uh, and then go through the Department of State. And so in situations like that, unfortunately, you could be looking at a much longer backlog or wait time than you would have been uh, otherwise. Um, again, this is always really going to depend on your location. Um, and there's a lot of variation. And so unfortunately, it's hard to give an exact response about wait times for folks who are doing visas through the embassies and consulates. Um, it could be from a few months after you get your I-130 approval up to one year, maybe two years. Um, I did see a question in the chat about B-1 visas for Ghana. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but I'm going to see if I can pull up some information for you on that and jump through to it at the end, okay? Um, so going back and talking more generally about the backlogs. So um, one of the big issues we've seen um, is USCIS, which is U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. So they're the agency that is responsible for the majority of the immigration processes that y'all are going through. So if you're inside the United States applying for a green card, you're dealing with USCIS. If you are applying for DACA, you're dealing with USCIS. Um, if you are applying for VAWA or a U visa, you're also dealing with USCIS. Um, Unfortunately, because so many people are dealing with USCIS, uh, that means that the agency has developed a really large backlog. Um, at the beginning of this year, they were looking at about 9.5 million outstanding cases. And by some reports from people in the agency, they currently have over 5 million cases that are outside of standard processing times. So what that means is of 9.5 million cases, almost more than half of those cases are taking longer to process than they would have several years ago. So the vast, uh, a substantial majority of you who are waiting for something from USCIS, it's, it's longer than it should be. So if you feel like you're waiting more than you should, unfortunately, you probably are. Um, I do see another question, F2As. F2A has been really difficult as well, and actually let me um, come back to that one as well, because that's going to be about the consular service, and that's an interesting question as well. Um, yes, sorry, I'm trying to keep track of everybody's comments. Yeah, the UK is one that really has moved um, fair fairly quickly compared to some of the others, but you can still end up waiting several months to get that interview. But once you get your interview, usually they get their act together pretty quickly. No, the NBC is not working efficiently. <laughs> that, that unfortunately is uh, one that has been happening for a long time. Um, and so as far as the USCIS, um, their backlogs are extreme and they are frankly um, getting worse. Um, some of these cases, however, are seeing improvements in the backlog. So if you are somebody who has filed an application for citizenship, um, a naturalization application on N-400, those cases are back at processing times that are essentially the same as before the pandemic happened. Um, the Biden administration came in in early 2021 and laid out a um, really quite good agenda on how they were going to tackle the backlogs and the issues that we'd seen grow up in the naturalization context, especially because people who are waiting to get their citizenship are also unable to vote. They're unable to partake in some of the rights and privileges that they would have access to otherwise. So this is a really important issue. It's very exciting to see the government taking it seriously. Again, though, like everything else, there is going to be that variation depending on where you live. So, for example, some cities, you're going to be looking at maybe six months to 12 months of a wait time. 
other cities, you know, it could just be, you know, three, four months. Um, in 2019, Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, I believe, was the fastest in the country. It was processing them in a matter of weeks. So it really is going to depend where you live when you file that application and when you do your interview on how long that NAPS processing time is going to be. You're able to check that at the USCIS Processing Times website, and we'll share a link for that at the end of the chat. So. Uh, I had also mentioned that um, certain cases are taking longer than others. So one of the big stories in 2022 has been work authorization delays. So many of you here have probably experienced that, this yourselves, unfortunately. Um, applying for your EAD, um, employment authorization document, you're, some people are waiting in excess or more than a year to receive an approval on that. And that actually is true for folks who are applying to renew their work authorization as well. So these are people who have already been approved, have been working on their EAD, and just simply need to renew their paperwork to continue working. Unfortunately, some of these cases you're looking at seven months, eight months, a, a year is the far outside. That is not the norm, and I do want to stress that that is not the norm for most people. However, I have heard those stories, and it is something to be aware of out there. Now, a bright spot on this, however, is that not all EADs are taking that long to process. So for folks who already have DACA and a work authorization through their DACA status, they instead are able to see their EAD renewals come through in approximately three months. So both the Nebraska Service Center and the Vermont Service Center are doing a pretty good job turning around those work authorization approvals for DACA people. Um, another big piece of news on EAD backlogs uh, came out approximately two weeks ago. And that was when um, the Biden administration has said that they are going to um, take a couple new actions to try to reduce some of these issues. And for EAD specifically, that includes allowing people to continue working um, with only their receipt notice as proof of their valid authorization. So what this means, if you're someone who already has your work authorization and you're ready to renew, but the renewal is taking too long to come back, Rather than your current EAD expiring while that you wait for the new one, you can use the receipt that USCIS sends you when you file your renewal application to show your employer that you still have legal authorization to work. So what that means is folks have 540, I might misquote the number, it's either 540 or 545 days that they'll be able to work on that original EAD. So essentially this is nearly, it's a year extension on an EAD. Um, but that doesn't do anything to necessarily reduce the underlying backlog. It merely allows you to continue working while USCIS processes your application. So though this is a measure that is welcome, it's going to be helpful for a lot of people, it is not going to actually reduce the backlog. Um, you know, there are things that we wish that USCIS would do in this regard that could speed this process up, but unfortunately, until they do decide to make those process changes, um, I think more waiting, unfortunately, is going to be the norm. Now, um, so in general, overall processing times have increased about 25% across the board at USCIS. Um, and, you know, it, without major sort of structural change in how USCIS is handling applications, unfortunately, it looks like that is going to be sort of the norm for, you know, the foreseeable future. On that note, somebody had mentioned that the NVC was not working efficiently. The NVC, unfortunately, is also facing very large backlogs. Um, we, they just released their backlog report uh, a couple days ago, and um, we did go through and analyze at Boundless what those numbers are looking like. And unfortunately, the, um, the backlog reduction for the NVC has been really minuscule. Um, they only managed to get through a couple hundred cases in April. Um, so going into May, we're really looking at, um, you know, virtually no change at all in the green card backlog for folks who are trying to come from outside the country or through the NVC. Um, and let me pull up those specific numbers for you guys, because some of them were pretty wild. Um, but as far as I can tell, there was only a reduction of about 222 cases in the queue. So if you consider that there are hundreds of consulates around the world, um, you know, that or well over 100 consulates that are processing these applications, they really made very little progress. Um, so as far as the F2A, which somebody else mentioned, that's going to be related to um, 
the backlog issue as well. F2A is the family preference second category for folks who are immigrating through a family member who is a green card or a lawful permanent resident holder. So um, when they sponsor somebody, um, they have to come through the consular process, which means unfortunately you have to deal with the National Visa Center. The National Visa Center's role is to collect all of your documents um, after the initial family petition or I-130 has been approved. So this is going to be your Form I-864 Affidavit of Support. It's going to be your tax returns from your sponsor, pay stubs, proof of employment status, um, additional evidence um, just to strengthen the application and the final entry for the interview. Theoretically, then, the NBC works with the consulates to schedule your interview. As I touched on before, not all consulates are fully operational, and some of them are not conducting interviews at this time, or at least interviews for um, immigrant visas, which would be green cards. We have seen improvement in um, some visas, employment-based uh, visas, as well as the K-1 fiancé visa. Um, but in terms of the actual overall green card backlog, we have seen very minor movement. Um, it actually uh, decreased 12%, uh, so we we're really hoping to see these numbers shift much more meaningfully. Um, but they actually have kind of reversed, unfortunately, um, which is a little concerning as we move into summer when usually visa applications begin to increase because people like to travel. Um, how, as far as F2A, getting back to that, if you've had your I-130 approved and you were waiting for um, F2A, the family second preference category has been current since early summer 2019, which is sort of a historic thing. Um, I had never seen it current really at all, um, and it has now been current for over two years. Unfortunately, part of the reason for that is because the embassies and consulates closed during the pandemic, there were not visas being issued. And so as people move through the process, they just got stuck at the NBC, sort of like a parking lot. Um, one part of the process is done, but you have to get through that interview stage to keep going. Unfortunately, because U.S immigration law is structured in such a way there is a maximum number of green cards that be, can be given each year to folks coming into the country and that's true for both family-based and employment-based. Um, if there are no interviews happening and we reach the end of the year those green cards essentially disappear and so some of you may have seen that you know several you know nearly 200,000 green cards were wasted last year they just essentially disappeared at the end of the fiscal year in October. So the goal is from the agency that they will not see a repeat of that, but unfortunately, without the consulate scheduling interviews to fill that gap, it's hard for them realistically, I think, to keep that promise. Um, we hope that they will, but you know, all things being equal, um, there's just a certain amount of interviews that would need to happen for a certain amount of visas. And if they're not scheduling those interviews, then you're gonna have a bit more, a bit more of a wait, unfortunately. However, as long as F2A is current, um, that shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't create negative impacts. It's um, only a matter of if there was a sudden large shift in the currency dates. I don't have a reason to believe that that's gonna happen in the near future because the currency dates are based on the number of people receiving their green cards. And since those numbers have been low, the government's not hitting their maximum quota. Um, there's no reason for them to reduce the number of overall availability. So I don't foresee F2A uh, stopping being current in the near future. That is not a promise. That is just sort of how it seems to me at this time. Now, as far as um, I did see some more questions about interviews. Okay. Um, as far as the NBC process, I-130 wait times, that first step with USCIS, you're looking at a really broad range depending on which service center processes your application. So the range there is actually five months to 15 months. Um, I want to say the California service center is processing in five months, but um, the majority of them you're looking at between eight and 14 months. So there is quite a wait on the I-130 there. Depending what consulate you are, the transfer period between USCIS to the NBC should not be more than two to three months at maximum. We've seen it happen in the same week because they are working on digitizing files more. So theoretically, that window of time, that waiting period should get shorter. 
But again, it's once you get through there, it kind of becomes a question mark about which embassy are you going to be interviewing at. And that's going to determine your final waiting time for the interview for whichever visa you're applying for. Um, if you are applying for an IR1, um, any of the family-based visas, one of the first things that they're really going to ask you is to show that you have a valid or what the law calls a bona fide relationship with your sponsor. So an IR1 or a conditional resident, CR1, both of these visas are for spouses of U.S. citizens. So in that case, then what the officer is going to be trying to find out is, are you who you say you are? Uh, and is your marriage to this U.S. citizen valid under the law? And is it a real marriage? So that means a marriage for, uh, you know, the usual reasons, you know, love or, you know, you have a family connection, things like that, but not a marriage for the purposes of getting an immigration benefit. So it can't only be a marriage for a green card, for example. So the questions that they ask you in an interview are going to be sort of tailored to understanding the validity or the realness, quote unquote, of your relationship. So uh, you can expect sometimes questions about, tell me about how you met. What was your first date? Have you met each other's parents? Um, some of these things might have been covered in your initial I-130 uh, petition, or if you're doing a fiancé K-1 in your I-129F, because that's also about the validity of your relationship. Um, so don't be surprised, though, if they ask you to repeat things or if they ask you for additional information. They're trying to understand your relationship and make sure that everything's on the up and up. Um, you may also have seen some um, posts from our a uh, company talking about some of the questions can sometimes seem a little invasive. Um, in my personal experience working with clients, this was more likely at USCIS, but that doesn't mean that you won't get weird questions at the Department of State. So what do I mean by weird questions? Well, they might ask you something that makes you blush. <laughs> they might ask you about um, your alone time with your partner. Um, Obviously, these sorts of questions are not going to apply if you're petitioning for other family members, such as parents or children. But don't be too surprised if an officer asks you something that you feel is a little bit of a touchy question about your relationship. Um, they are make, just um, supposed to be making sure that you do have a valid marriage. Um, and uh, just answer honestly to the best of your ability and uh, just try not to be too shy. <laughs> um, and so finally, it looks like... After USCIS begins active review of your I-130, how long does it take for approval? So that can really vary. The actual adjudication of the form itself, I suspect, is not a particularly time-intensive process. Um, in many cases, an officer at USCIS is going to review the petitioner application um, pretty close in time before they issue a decision. So for example, an I-485 that was filed with an I-130, they will often um, review that application in full just before the interview. Um, the I-130 process is a little different, but in general, um, it is just about determining that validity of the relationship, making sure everyone who is who they say they are. The actual wait time that you're dealing with there is just for the time for your file to actually get to an officer. So if you think about how many millions of people are applying, there are only so many USCIS officers. So your case gets there, someone at USCIS looks it over when it first arrives, makes sure everything that needs to be there is there, and then they forward it to whichever service center or field office is gonna do the final check. Um, but once it gets to that final field office, it might sit there for several months until somebody has time to look at it. So the actual adjudication of the form is relatively quick, but you're gonna wait a while to get to the front of the line. Um, so just now I was discussing the form I-130. That is the petition for alien relative or the petition for your non-citizen foreign relative. So if you are um, a United States citizen or you have a green card, the I-130 is the form that you file for your spouse to come live in the United States. That's what generally starts the process for um, to bring your spouse into the country. If you are not yet married and you are a U.S. citizen, you can petition for your fiance to come on a K-1 visa, but that process is only available to sponsors who are U.S. citizens. Unfortunately, it's not available to green card holders. Um, 
But for folks who are already married, if you're a U.S. citizen or a green card holder, you can petition for your spouse to come to the United States. And the first step would be with the Form I-130. Um, and that is something that Boundless has a lot of information about. If you check boundless.com, we've got um, FAQs about the I-130, about which process is best for you. Um, and then we also, of course, the service itself will walk folks through the entire process, try to make it as easy for you and your family um, to reunite as possible. So I'm just gonna take a quick second, excuse me y'all, and let's see, make sure I got some more questions. Um, expediting is a good topic when we're talking about backlogs. Um, so USCIS has rules about um, when they will expedite a case. In general, it's going to be um, humanitarian reasons. So if there's a serious medical issue, um, if the place where your family member is, is no longer safe, um, so this could be because of um, a natural disaster, it could be due to war, civil instability, um, serious food shortages, um, any of those kind of issues can be considered by USCIS. Um, they will also consider extreme financial hardship. Um, that one is often um, more difficult for people in a family-based context to show. Um, and so generally humanitarian um, choices that in my experience that is where many um, family-based folks end up making their argument now whether uscis is going to grant those is very hit or miss um, in terms of certain documents like eads it's extremely difficult to get an expedite request um, and over the past several years we have not seen i personally have not seen widespread success in getting the government to expedite cases absent a serious, um, a very serious issue. I've seen them deny people um, to travel to be with sick parents um, whose parents had passed away. Um, things that you really would expect would be very important reasons for people to travel. Um, so in terms of expediting, um, it's often best if you can find, um, speak with a professional, so an immigration attorney who's knowledgeable. Boundless actually has an Ask My Attorney program where you pay a flat small fee, about $25 a month, and you can ask immigration attorneys questions about various different issues. Um, and this, this would be a good one to get some advice that's specific to your case. Um, in general, if there's a reason that um, you know, you might feel that your family member is in danger or that they are not, you know, safe. Um, those can be good reasons. It's just a matter of presenting it to the government in a way that they will understand. Um, sworn sponsor statements. Um, those are going to be, um, so there could be two things there. I think what you're asking about is going to be statements showing um, from the sponsor that they do intend to fully support the person that they are petitioning for. So when somebody's filing a green card or a fiance visa petition, they're going to file either an I-864 or an I-134 affidavit of support. And this is a document that is essentially a contract that shows the government um, that the person who's coming into the country will have resources available to them from their sponsor to uh, basically stay off government services. Um, and so a sworn statement, the affidavit of uh, support itself um, does sort of show that to the government. That's the official document. But a sponsor and other people as well can choose to execute a sworn statement that essentially just gives additional evidence to the government. So this could be, um, you know, something just as simple as a letter explaining, you know, this is how we met, we've been together this amount of time, this is my income, etc. You may also see other people use sworn statements from family members. So if you've not been living with your partner um, because you work in different countries and you're going through the process that way, some people may have family members write sworn statements attesting to their relationship, essentially saying, I met my daughter's husband, we spend Christmas together, or we spend Eid together, whatever, um, go on holidays together, we go to the beach. Um, and so things like that that essentially just strengthen your evidence to the government, showing that you have that bona fide marriage that they're looking for when they're reviewing your application. Um, I got another question here about filing the I-485 at the same time as the I-130. So it is not required to file I-130 and I-485 at the same time. In some cases, some people cannot file them at the same time. 
Um, however, if, um, if under certain circumstances, if you are in the United States, you can concurrently file, so file at the same time, the I-130, the I-485, as well as a work and a travel authorization. If you file them all at the same time, if you're able to, it will save you the cost of the filing fee on the I-130. So if you file them separately, you have to pay the I-130 filing fee, you have to pay the I-45 filing fee. In some cases, you're able to separate. But again, not everybody is eligible for this. Um, and for folks who have to come in from outside the country through the consular process at the embassies, unfortunately, you are not going to be able to file those at the same time. So it is going to potentially lengthen your process. But again, that's going to depend on where you're located. Um, all right, scrolling down, scrolling down. I think... Oh, I did get a question about how long does it usually take to bring a spouse to the United States from Nigeria? This one, um, off the top of my head, unfortunately, I don't have a solid number for you. Um, there was quite a backlog for um, applicants coming from Nigeria under the previous administration because, as you might recall, there was a travel ban against um, several countries that were Muslim majority. And then that was followed up um, about two years later with a travel ban that pre um, prevented certain folks from Africa from entering the country. And that did apply to Nigeria, um, among other countries. And so a lot of folks who got I-130 approval during that time were not able to interview because of the travel ban. So that went on, that lasted for a bit, oh, almost two years, about a year and a half. And so once those embassies reopened, they had to work back through that backlog. So as far as the exact time, um, it's gonna depend a lot on that I-130 processing time, which for some folks we're looking at, I'd like to say seven to 10 months. Presuming that there aren't any um, security concerns, that there aren't any issues with finding documentation, um, you know, everything is just kind of straightforward, that part should be relatively quick, but then it's going to really depend on the consulate. Um, that's something that I'd be happy to look into, but again, on the top of my head, I don't have a firm number for how long um, interviews are taking right now there. Okay, so I am scrolling down again one more time. Um, same thing on uh, the question with Colombia. I'm so sorry. Um, because there is so much very um, variation between the consulates, we don't have the exact numbers. What I can tell you guys, and we'll share this link as well at the end, is we just updated our current status of US visa services by country. So Boundless has a report that goes through all of the countries that have US embassies and consulates and discusses whether they're open, whether they're conducting interviews, etc. So that should help give you a general time but this is something as well in boundless that we're really hoping to really dig into and get firmer numbers because everybody wants to know how long is this gonna take because um, a lot of you have already been waiting a long time um, and then let's see I think I just saw one more question um, I know that we had a question about Ghana and B1 visas um, so there is a plan on F2As at the NBC, um, or at least there's a goal of a plan. Um, I don't work for the government, so unfortunately they keep a lot of, uh, they keep a lot of secrets from the rest of us. Um, however, um, they did, um, they have alluded to plans to really address the backlog because this is a problem that um, the leadership of the agency does take very seriously. Um, the backlog hurts a lot of people. It hurts immigrants. It hurts families trying to, you know, reunite. It hurts the U.S. economy. It's, you know, it causes a lot of issues, not least of which is it also makes USCIS officers miserable. Um, it makes their jobs harder. And so there is pressure from inside the organization as well to really improve a lot of these issues. Um, now, one of the problems we're going to run into, of course, is that USCIS is part of the Department of Homeland Security, whereas um, the NBC is going to operate more with the Department of State. So when you're looking at these backlog issues, some things are going to improve, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the agencies are going to work in tandem. Um, in my um, opinion, over the last couple of years, they haven't done a very spectacular job of communicating with each other. Um, for those of you who remember the public charge rule, there was a different rule at the Department of Homeland Security than from the Department of State. 
DHS had the I-944, DOS had a completely different form that then they didn't use. Um, there was a, a really big disconnect between what was happening at both agencies, even though they both work on immigration. And so it's hard to predict. Um, I do, as frustrating as this has been, I do believe that they are trying to improve it. Um, I think the issue we're running into is that I'm not sure that um, they've been able to make the progress. They haven't, I don't think they've worked aggressively enough to look at how they can improve these backlogs. I think they're making incremental small changes. We're way past small changes. <laughs> um, and so, you know, as I had alluded to earlier, the NBC backlog is sort of treading water. It's stayed over 400,000 cases for the last several months. They started to make progress at the beginning of the year, and then it's really just slowed down again. Um, the F2A, in terms of those being issued, um, again, unfortunately, that's a function of location. So some people are getting some F2As. Um, but for a lot of people, they're just sort of waiting and there has not been a lot of information from the government, unfortunately, on what exactly they're planning to do to fix that. They just have said, we're going to fix that. So unfortunately, I'm playing telephone with you and passing that along. Um, but we really don't have a clear idea of how they're going to tackle this issue. Um, but I do believe that there are people who care about fixing this problem. Um, not least of which, um, myself. <laughs> um, all right, so I see. Um, so um, as far as, um, I did see a question there at the end and then we'll get ready to wrap up, I think. So if you do have any more backlog questions, go ahead and drop those in now before we wrap up in a few minutes. Um, but the last question that I saw there was talking about overstays and ESTA. Um, and so for those of you um, who aren't familiar, ESTA is um, also called the Visa Waiver Program. And this is um, essentially a treaty between the United States and other countries that allows um, travel back and forth without a full visa application process ahead of time. So for some of you who have been to countries that have things like landing visas, it's a similar idea. You're sort of pre-approved before you get there. Um, ESTA, however, is um, classified similarly to a B2 visitor visa, and so it's not going to allow people to work in the United States, and it does have a sort of a, a hard exit requirement. You are supposed to be out of the country by the end of that 90 days. In general, um, somebody who overstays any visa is going to begin accruing what is called unlawful presence. An unlawful presence can prevent somebody from getting a visa in the future or from adjusting status and getting a green card. Um, if you stay in the United States for um, more than six months without a lawful status and then you leave the country, you can trigger... Um, a bar to re-entry for three years, which means you cannot come back to the United States for three years. You cannot get a green card, cannot get a visa, do not pass go. If you've been here for more than a year without status, they can kick you out for five years. So there's a pretty serious consequence for this. Um, in general, um, folks who are married to a United States citizen can have unlawful presence forgiven. But again, this can be a tricky area of law and it can require a waiver um, if someone has already traveled in the meantime. So if you ever have questions about what your legal status is, if it's safe to leave the country, if you're worried about getting back, if you hope to apply for a visa or a green card or citizenship in the future, you wanna be really careful that you don't make any mistakes earlier on that could damage that chance in the future. So in that case, again, I would strongly recommend, um, you know, speaking with an immigration attorney, um, either somebody who's local to you, who knows sort of your regional USCIS office, um, or, you know, in the situation, like I had mentioned, we have our Ask My Attorney program, um, where our attorneys are, um, there are attorneys, excuse me, available to speak with you and answer um, sort of general immigration questions like that. Um, so I do see that we've had um, quite a few questions regarding Pakistan, and I also saw questions on Ghana and Colombia. So I am making a note to myself that we can talk about those um, and next time we all meet up, because I know um, we are actually seeing a lot of interest from um, folks over there, and so I wanna make sure we get you guys that um, useful information. Um, so I'm not seeing any more backlog questions just yet. So I wanted to just go ahead then and give a quick final plug. We're gonna drop a couple links for you guys that you can read about um, the current backlog at the NBC, 
the status of U.S. embassies and consulates, and as well the link for the processing time, so you can check case um, times at USCIS. They do say that they are working on reducing those backlogs. They've got goals to get the K-1 visa petition down to six months. Um, they've got goals um, to reduce a lot of these processing times by the end of this fiscal year, which would be in September. So fingers crossed, you know, we hope that we're gonna see that come to fruition. And we'll get you guys that extra information as well um, when we post this video. Um, as far as citizenship, I do see a quick question I'll snag before we go here. It's how long can you wait to file for citizenship after getting a green card for 10 years and only being here for almost three years? So um, that can also depend on whether you're, how somebody got their citizenship. So folks who got citizenship um, through a spouse uh, who is a U.S. citizen can usually apply for their citizenship three years. So you have to still be married to the U.S. citizen. You have to have been married for that three years. But if you've had a green card for those three years and you've been married, you can apply for your citizenship. Otherwise, the wait time is generally going to be five years. However, you don't have to file in five years. Some people do wait to file longer, which I don't necessarily... Um, there are reasons to do that, but again, timing issues like that are always going to be really specific to your individual situation, and that's always something that you're going to want to talk with an immigration lawyer about. But in general, it's going to be a five-year wait after you get a green card, um, and you do need to show continuous residence and physical presence in the U.S. So if you've only, if someone's only been living in the United States for three years, you're probably going to need to show a little extra time because the government is going to add up how long you've actually been present in the United States during the last five years. Um, so if you have citizenship questions, that's another, um, that is another topic that um, we're happy to talk about. So... Um, <laughs> yeah, you want to be really careful about always being honest. So, um, yeah, any questions like that, please send them into our Instagram account. We keep try to keep track of all of your questions so we know what people want to hear talking about on the next live. Um, so I am going to go ahead then and sort of wrap this up for today. I've really appreciated everybody's questions. It's been really good to chat with everybody. Um, Um, and then, uh, you know, like I said, send in your, sorry, I'm reading comments, send in your questions so we can get to them next time. Um, and I will be looking into Pakistan, Ghana, and Colombia, um, and the F2A questions for you all. Um, I hope you all have a lovely day, um, and stay safe out there. We'll see you all in 10 weeks. Thanks and take care.